Well, you know, as a teenager growing up there in Indianapolis, uh, and I started playing jazz, you know, Freddie Hubbard, and James Spaulding, and myself, Melvin Ryan, and uh, we were the younger guys. That, but, uh, uh, and, and Monk, mm -hmm. your uncle, William, I always called him Monk, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the whole family, you know, and, and Buddy, and, and uh, Irvina, you know, Wes and Buddy and Monk, I mean, they were just, they were just, we were all like family. And all the musicians there in Indianapolis, you know, right. it was like that, you know, we were from different mothers, but we were still brothers, you know. Right. Right. I mean, we had that kind of amicable interplay with each other. Nobody had any kind of egotistical attitudes or anything like that, you know, nothing like that at all. We used to go out there and on the matinees because we were underage. We were only about 15 or 16 years old. And they tease us when we come in. But they were also always so nice to us. But we had that kind of family relationship, you know. And, and uh, Wes was always cracking jokes and stuff like that. Monk was businessman, you know. Monk would take care of business. And then he, when he moved to Vegas, he started the Las Vegas Jazz Society. You know all the history on all that. But, uh, you know. Spend time with Dad by himself? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I used to play gigs with him. And uh, I would, go, like I say, I would sit in with him. Mm -hmm. And we'd, it was like a family. You know, all the different musicians that were there. We all used to hang out. And uh, it was a very nurturing environment because nobody had any kind of egos that are out of shape or anything like that. How was, uh, how was Dan in the studio? Yo. When you played with him in the studio? Oh, in the studios? Oh, yeah, well, you know, you know, Wes, Wes is something. You, you know, I used to mess with him sometimes, you know. Because, you know, he couldn't read right. music. It was as big as that tree over there. <laughs> but, I mean, whew, you're talking about a genius. Genius. All three of the brothers. They, they, they just had this natural talent, man. And just genius mentalities as far as the music. And, and just nice, nice guys, you know. Yeah. And they took... Freddie Hubbard and James Spaulding, Melvin Ryan and myself, they we were like their younger brothers. So when did you meet Daddy? How did you come about? Well, I didn't really meet him. Uh, I mean, by the time I saw him, uh, uh, I, I had played with this organ player named Jimmy Smith. They were good friends. <laughs> You know, so, so, uh, uh, but, uh, I, uh, what can I say? Uh, I, I went to a couple of Wes's record dates. Okay. Because uh, Jimmy Smith and mm -hmm. him, they, they recorded uh, the same system. They had the same, uh, uh, what can I, how can you describe that? You know, the corporations run all of this. The labels, all right. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. so they, they run all of that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I got a chance to just go see it. And plus, the, <coughs> the drummer they were using for Jimmy and Wes mm -hmm. was a guy named, what's, what's this guy's name? Anyway, this guy was from, lived around Washington, D.C., okay. which is where I'm from. Gotcha. And so this guy had known me since I was a little boy. Mm -hmm. So why well, can't Grady Grady Tate? Okay, yeah, yeah. Grady yeah. Tate. Yeah, so so uh, so Grady was the drummer, and uh, and Herbie Hancock was the studio piano player, Ron Carter. Okay, and they were recording, so I got a chance to go to some of the record dates. Gotcha. You know, because you know they weren't. I was I wasn't known enough or uh, respected enough to be on those record dates. Oh, right. Okay. You know what I mean? But yeah. I could go. I could go see it. Mm -hmm. So so I saw West like that mm -hmm. you know 
and uh, and that's how, who I knew was Monk. Oh, Monk was, you know, because you know he uh, he was like a philosopher. Yeah, he's yeah. very philosophical yeah, guy, and and, and 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 he would do it in such a, a comic comic way. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, he was always funny. I mean, it was funny. You think a cat like him, because he looked serious, he looked, uh, but, but he was always telling jokes. Right, right. You know, and, uh, and always laughing about stuff. Mm -hmm. And so when I, when I left Jimmy, uh, you know, I went home and whatever, and Monk uh, and Wes came through town, which is Washington, D.C. Okay. And I guess, I, you know, I, I, I can only imagine uh, that, you know, he just uh, wanted to make a change. Mm -hmm. And he was in Washington, D.C. Man, if he had been anywhere else, right. and evidently Monk suggested me, yeah. you know. And so then, you know, I didn't have a lot of records. I only had maybe eight records, right. you know. And um, one of them was smoking at the half note. I got it right away. And I mean, literally, I can trace almost everything that I do, yeah. and not just to West, but to Wynton mm -hmm. Kelly, Paul Chambers, and Jimmy. Right. I mean, it's like completely formed by that record and a couple mm -hmm. other ones. April of 1968, he played Kansas City Jazz Festival, mm -hmm. and it was a big deal yeah. in every possible way. Mm -hmm. um, he was at his absolute peak at that yeah. point but I mean I was 13 too I'd only been playing for like a year mm -hmm. he was already my hero right. um, and you know the Kansas City Jazz Festival was at the Municipal Auditorium this huge place where the ice capades would come yeah. and all that yeah. stuff and there was like no security right. so I just walked right backstage and he was standing there with his guitar on mm -hmm. his foot with this brown suit yeah and talking to Clark Terry, who was okay. also a favorite mm -hmm. of my family because of the trumpet thing. And they were laughing because they were yeah. buddies and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I just, you know, walked up. It's like, you know, can I get your autograph? And he was like super nice, like, oh, sure. Yeah. And he signed the program for me. And, um, you know, I just kind of stood there kind of like, you know, yeah. probably with my mouth open, mm -hmm. like also looking at the guitar, which was like, you know, the whole, all, all of it to me was like, Steven Spielberg, yeah, golden yeah. lighting, you know, it was, li well, and also he had a thing, man. I ah. mean, it was like, you know, this was like, you know, like a, you know, just a, a figure that was yeah. larger than life in a lot of ways. So, so we, we went up to the local music store and said, I think we should get some jazz records. Okay. And so the, the fellow at the store said, well, these are the guys I recommend, Wes Montgomery and Howard Roberts and Joe Pass and Barney Kessel. Why don't you pick three of the records? So one of the records that, that got my attention was Bumpin'. And so the, the lighthouse was very close, so your dad used to play there. Yeah. And um, so I think I was about 14 when I, I first, uh, first went and heard him play. And at the time, that it's, the club's still there. It's more of a blues bar now, but and it's like a cigar shape. And, and the... Um, the, the the bar was here and the bandstand was there like 15 feet away and and I could sit right at the bar because in those days they let the kids sit there okay. and and so I could sit at the bar and 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 be you know have it be close to your dad and um, and it just blew me away I think I, I saw him twice there and maybe once at Shelley's yeah your, your sister one of your sister I forget which one she Francis. Went, Francis when we did the Hollywood Bowl tribute yeah that's right. To your know. dad and Joe Pass had just passed away, and they brought in Mundell Lowe, and um, George Benson was there, and uh, my record Westbound, and dedicated to your, mm -hmm. your dad, had come out the year before, or no, yeah, just a few months before, and so we do this uh, this concert, and she's there, and and uh, for some reason I tell her the story about the lighthouse, and I was fourteen and met your dad and got a a signature and and uh and she said oh he, he spoke about that he remembers that i said yeah right he doesn't remember that you know it's like <laughs> i was 14 i was nobody and uh and she said no but that was it there weren't too many young kids and you probably looked even younger than you were and i said yeah well maybe. it's a nice it's a nice thought <laughs> so um i remember seeing george benson on television when i was 12 and the sound of that 
was yeah. appealing to me. So I went and bought some Benson records and um, I read on the, on the liner notes that he was influenced by your father, right? right? right. So there was a guy in my church who also played guitar. Okay. He saw that I was interested in that kind of guitar playing. He said, oh, you like this? I said, yeah. He said, well, come by my house. I wanna, okay. I wanna, I wanna, I wanna play you some things. And his name was Brother Ennis Claude. We called him Butch. Okay. And he gave me, he turned me on to two records, Smoking at the Half Note and Boss Guitar. And that ruined me for life, man. <laughs> um, the first one was Full House, and then I got turned on to Groove Brothers. It was a process. It's, you know, um, and it was my first, actually, Wes was the first transcription that I ever did when I had a teacher. And he said, listen, if, he said, you're a good guitar player, Mimi, but if you want to play jazz, you got to listen and you got to transcribe from the masters. And so I said, well, I got this Wes Montgomery album. He said, you can't, he said, you can't start anywhere better. And you can't end anywhere better than Wes. <laughs> yeah. And I think yeah. about that and I think, yeah. When were you, were you introduced to dad or is it, how, how did you come well, about? Well, um, I just remember, okay, initially, you know, it was just hearing his name in mm -hmm. the pantheon of yeah. guitar, great guitar players, right? And uh, I never, you know, I remember it, but I didn't pay that much attention. And then over time, his name came up a lot more. And as I got more into guitar, mm -hmm. a lot of people were influenced by him. But these are guys that I knew. Well, one, one of the guys I really dig is George Benson. And George Benson yeah. was a, mm -hmm. a huge Wes Montgomery, uh, sure what do you call it, right? <laughs> it but, uh, and there was other guys, and Steve Lukather, you mm -hmm. know. Um, Anyway, and at some point, I got turned on to f uh, four six. Yeah, four on six. Four on six, right? And there was some licks on there, and I was like, yeah. "Oh wow, <laughs> you know, this is yeah. really cool." And so then, and then I started to investigate it a little bit more later on, like mm -hmm. I, after I learned. I mean, this wasn't that long ago when I actually yeah. first okay. heard that, and uh, and then I started learning some of these licks and mm -hmm. doing it by ear, right? But right. then, but then I I got a hold of some tablature. Mm -hmm. And he had some really sort of different, especially for me, cause being a rock guy, right. different ways of going about finding these notes. And it just mm -hmm. became really interesting. Yeah. And I started listening to him a lot more. But the thing was, is that I was, it appealed to me because it was very bluesy. Yeah. So you had all the trappings of, of, mm -hmm. of real jazz with a lot of crazy passing tones and use a lot of intricate chord structure underneath, you know, the, the, right. the, the guitar leads are going along with these chords. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but for some reason, it just seems so effortless and bluesy and soulful yeah. compared to a lot of jazz yeah. that I, you know, had experienced that mm -hmm. I, I got really sort of like, oh, this guy is really great, <laughs> you know? And it just changed <laughs> yeah. my, my attitude towards jazz guitar. I was playing in a band um, uh, with my friend Vince Mariani and um, we were playing we were writing all this instrumental rock stuff, and he said, hey, have you ever heard of Wes Montgomery? And he played me some of Wes, and I was immediately drawn into the tone and the sound. That's always been kind of what's, what draws me into music uh, initially, is just the, the sonic greeting of the sound, you know? And, um, so I, I, I fell in love with it the first time I ever heard it, and then as the years progressed, I went on to, to listen and study other um, jazz guitarists and stuff, but, um, Wes always remained my favorite. 